Projective modules play an important role in homological algebra, a crucial role. We now learn how to resolve an arbitrary module over a ring by projective modules. Let me start by defining what I mean to resolve a module. Let M be an R module. R is just a ring. A resolution of this module M is an exact chain complex where you have the module M at the end And then you have modules M0, M1, M2, and so on. Exactness means, in particular, that the map epsilon is surjective, and the kernel of this map is the image of the differential from M1 to M0. You could phrase this, uh, phrase this little, a little differently by saying that by saying that uh, this is just a chain complex starting with m0 m star together with an isomorphism from the homology in degree 0 to M and vanishing homology in all other degrees. So if you have this exact chain complex then the map epsilon induces this um, isomorphism from H0 because H0 is just M0 divided by the image and the image was exactly the kernel of epsilon and therefore you get this isomorphism and the exactness um, beyond M0 is expressed by this being 0. And you want M, as in your chain complex, you want M minus 1 to be 0, not to be the original M or so, right? Yeah. When I say the chain complex M star, this is really M0, M1, yes. M2. And it has so nothing in negative degrees. Yeah. Okay. Projective resolution of M is a resolution that consists of projective modules. And now the modules I mean are M0, M1, and so on. Mm -hmm. The resolution of M such that these modules are projective, R modules. So not every module is projective. We will see that every module can be resolved. So for every module we can choose a resolution that is projective and to a certain extent, this projective resolution is also unique. To a certain extent, and to which extent is formulated by the fundamental theorem of homological algebra, which I state now. So the first statement is every R module has a projective resolution. I will now formulate a fact that has as a consequence that this projective resolution is unique up to chain homotopy equivalence. But I will formulate the statement in greater generality. And for that, um, I consider arbitrary chain complex of 
projective modules, not necessarily a cyclic or something. Just a chain complex of projective R modules. And Q star is another chain complex, not necessarily consisting of projective modules, but now I want to assume that it's acyclic in higher degrees. So it'll be an R chain complex, let's say, with a vanishing homology in degrees greater than zero. Let these brackets denote the set of chain homotopy classes of chain maps between P star and Q star. And it's not just a set, you can also add uh, maps and then if they were chain homotopic then also there is some is again chain homotopic. So this is actually an abelian group. Chain homotopy classes of chain maps. from P star to Q star. And the fundamental theorem of homological algebra tells us exactly what this group is. So on the one side, on the left side, I have this group. On the other side, I have the homomorphisms from H0 P star to H0. H0 P star, H0 Q star are again R modules. And there is a map from the left hand side to the right hand side by taking a representative, so a chain homotopy class of a chain map F star and mapping it to the map induced on H0. And I claim that this map is an isomorphism. Okay, so the map is certainly well defined if I have um, a different representative than its chain homotopic to this F star, but chain homotopic maps induce the same map on H0 as in any other degree. So it's a well-defined map and it's actually an isomorphism. So this is a rather abstract statement, but the consequence is the one we are most interested in. Namely, having two projective resolutions, we know there are chain homotopy equivalent. of the same R module are chain homotopy equivalent as chain complexes of R modules. So maybe before we prove the fundamental theorem of homological algebra, let's break this down and um, explain why this is a consequence of the fundamental theorem. Okay, so proof of this being a consequence of the fundamental theorem, although it's not very hard, let's spell it out. So you have this resolution of M here. And here you have the other one. So now this M is isomorphic to H0 of P star. And so this um, 
uh, how is this induced? Well, we have the epimorphism, the obvious epimorphism onto the quotient of P0 divided by the image. And then here, this map that was formerly notated epsilon induces this isomorphism. And the same here. So you have here H0 Q star in a similar factorization. Now, first of all, you want a chain map at all from P star to Q star. And this is given by the identity. So you look at the identity and then composing it with this isomorphism, you get a map from H0 P star to H0 Q star. The fundamental theorem tells us that such a homomorphism comes from a chain homotopy class of chain maps. In particular, it comes from a chain map. And that chain map we call F. So by the fundamental theorem, this is induced by a chain map F star P star to Q star by the fundamental theorem. Let's call it FT. And then reversing the roles and again looking at the identity. We get a chain map Q star to P star. So a chain map that starts from here in H0 and uses the map that goes via this isomorphism and then via the identity and then to H0 P star. Now, if you compose these two maps, so let's say first F star and then G star, then this induces obviously the identity on H0 P star. I'm a bit confused because the fundamental theorem as I stated it was not symmetric in the assumptions of P and Q. Yeah, but one assumption was that the domain was projective mm -hmm. and the target was um, a cyclic and now we assume this for both. Um, we assume yes, both properties. Both, okay. We assume projectivity and a cyclicity ah, right. because these are projective resolutions. Ah, so right. we can interchange the role, but it's a Excellent. good point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this induces the identity and by again by the fundamental theorem this means that this has to be chain homotopic to the identity because the identity also induces on H0 the identity. And again, reversing the roles. So if you want, this is the injectivity part of the second statement in the fundamental theorem. In the reversing the roles, we get also that this is homotopic to the identity now on Q star. Right, so we used the surjectivity to obtain F star, G star, and then we use twice the injectivity statement. We really use the full power to obtain that projective resolutions can be very different, but uh, they're still all chain homotopic to each other. So there is a unique chain homotopic class of projective resolutions. Let's prove the fundamental theorem now. And remember the first statement was the existence of a projective resolution at all. So we start with an arbitrary module, M, and build this resolution inductively. 
So first of all, we need a projective module at all that uh, subjects onto M and that always exists because we could take the free module generated by the elements of M and then send each element of M the basis as a basis element to the corresponding element in M. Uh, we've seen this also in the video before, so that definitely exists. And we take any such uh, projective module as our first step in building the projective resolution. So for the next step, we let's call this epsilon like before. Now we have this and there is a kernel that includes into this P zero. Projective resolution means that the next thing should be projective and it should zert checked onto the kernel of epsilon to have a vanishing homology at this point. And we just choose any projective module that subjects onto the kernel of epsilon and then define this here just by commutativity. So we just compose these two arrows to obtain the arrow or the map from P1 to P0. And then at this spot, we have by our construction that the kernel of epsilon is equal to the image of this map. Well, and then the next steps go the same, except that there is no epsilon, but the previous um, differential. So for Pn, we are already done with our work. We've built this uh, part up to degree n. So this part of the projective resolution, we want to find a Pn plus 1 that should subject onto, or let's call it, let's call it Dn. And then we look at the kernel of dn here and we find or choose any projective module that subjects here and define dn plus 1 as the composition. The projective resolution that you construct if you don't put uh, enough care into that and you just, for example, if you just uh, always take the the obvious and huge projective module, so the free abelian group on the elements here, if you pick this, then you get, first of all, an infinite projective resolution, it never ends. And it also consists typically of um, modules that don't have finite rank, so which are not finitely generated as R modules. But of course you can choose in specific cases, and that's the subject of study, um, very small resolutions. Sometimes it's very helpful to find small resolutions. But that doesn't concern us right now. We constructed at least some projective resolution for an arbitrary R module M. And now we want to um, obtain this statement characterizing the chain homotopy uh, classes of chain maps from P star to Q star, where P star and Q star are not necessarily projective resolutions now, but satisfy these assumptions that P star consists of projective modules. It's a chain complex of projective modules. Q star is a chain complex with vanishing homology in high degrees, not necessarily projective. So let me maybe just repeat the isomorphism that we are about to show. And we start by showing the search activity statement where we have to build a chain map inducing a prescribed map on uh, H0. So given um, a map, let's say phi from H Let's just write let phi be 
an R map from H0 pi star to H0 Q star. Okay, so what we want, let me write it here in blue. What we want is something like this. So we want maps F0, F1 and so on, so that this diagram here commutes. And let me write the differentials with uh, small letters and the modules with capital letters. All right, so that's the goal. And again, it's an inductive construction. So we first construct F0. Step zero. How do we get F zero? Well, look at this square. We compose these two maps and then we get a map from P zero to H zero um, Q star. So let me write it down. Compose it. Let's call this epsilon, uh, maybe blue. Let's call this epsilon and let's call this eta. And I compose epsilon with phi to h0 q star. And remember, I still have this epimorphism here given by eta. And now I use that p0 is projective because this is an extension problem that I can solve by the very definition of projectivity. I have this epimorphism and I can lift this map to Q0. So solve extension problem by projectivity of P0. This gives us F0. And of course, F0 is made in such a way that this first square commutes. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the next uh, square? Well, we can, okay, so maybe I formulate it, but it's very similar now. Um, again, we want to solve an extension problem. So I would look at the composition from pi 1 to Q0 and then try to lift this map here to Q1. The only problem is for this extension problem, I need surjectivity down there and the map Q1 is not surjective, but it is subjective onto the image. So that's what I, what I look at. Um, I'm looking at pi one and then again, I'm going via the differential and then F0. Then I land here in Q1. Here I have Q1. But now um, I want to say that I'm actually, let's move this to the right. It's not just Q0 I'm landing in, I'm actually landing in the image of Q1 here. And this is of course then automatically subjective. So this is in Q0. Okay, so a priori this map goes to Q0. I'm claiming it actually lands in the image here. To check that I can use the knowledge that this is the kernel of eta. So maybe it's easier, indeed it is easier to check that it lands in the kernel of eta. and then solve this and declare it to be F1. So that's how we proceed. The only thing we have to check is that this map actually lands in the kernel of eta. So let's check that by the, looking at the diagram. If I go from here to there and then by eta, it should be zero. But going from here 
to there is the same by commutativity as going two steps here and then down via phi, but going two steps here is zero. Also this is zero and therefore this lands in the kernel of eta and therefore in the image of Q1. So um, solve extension problem by projectivity of pi 1 and you see how we use all the assumptions. So we use also the exactness here. And then it goes on. Maybe let me, because this is a bit special, because there is the, the eta here, uh, let's do the general case. So step n, or is it n plus 1? Maybe n plus 1. General, the, the general step tries to construct the map from pn plus 1 to qn plus 1 by a very similar idea. So we compose the differential here with uh, the map fn. And one checks that one lies then in the image of qn plus 1 which is the same as the kernel of qn by the exactness. So maybe I should draw qn as well. So that we already constructed. Um, so I want to look at this composition and I claim that I actually land in here and then I can still include in here and I claim this commutes. So that will be checked in a second. And then I have this epimorphism that factorizes the differential qn plus 1. It's drawn in a different way than in, than in the extension problem for the definition of projectivity but I have this map to the image, I have this epimorphism, I can solve this extension problem by projectivity of pn plus 1 and declare it to be fn plus 1. So this then commutes, this obviously commutes, that this commutes, we still have to check, but if it will, then this fn plus 1 will make the whole square commutative and therefore be the, the next step in our construction of the chain map. Why does this commute, which is the same statement as the composition here, lands in the kernel of Qn? It's the same as before, because going like that is the same as going like that, but then you followed two successive arrows in a chain complex, and therefore it's zero. So that's the inductive construction of a chain map giving a prescribed map from H0 P star to H0 Q star. So that's the search activity part in the statement. For the injectivity part, we have to show that if you have two chain maps from P star to Q star, which induce the same map on H0, that they are chain homotopic. Maybe also even a bit surprising because this construction is very arbitrary, right? I mean, yeah. you, you solve a lifting problem. This is an arbitrary choice. And then you use this choice to formulate the next lifting problem. Yeah, so had you chosen a different previous uh, solution, it would affect all the later you'd choices. Get, right, yeah. you'd, you'd have a new problem to which you and again introduce an arbitrary choice. So sort of the choices yeah, are growing true. exponentially. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But chain homotopy equivalence is similar, I mean, you can somehow compare it maybe to homotopy equivalence of spaces and spaces could look very differently and mm -hmm. still be uh, homotopically e equivalent. So something similar is happening here. Let F star and G star now chain maps and using the same map on H0. then I want to construct a chain homotopy 
let's call it H star. F star and G star. And uh, let's spell it out because we will need this equation. What does chain homotopy mean? It means that Qn plus 1 composed Hn plus Hn minus 1 Pn is Fn minus Gn for all ns. Let me also, also say that Hn increases the degree by one. So the first map we have to construct is H zero. Uh, H minus one is, is zero because the chain complexes are zero in negative degrees. Therefore, this equality for n equals zero just means that Qn plus one composed, sorry, Q1 composed H zero is F zero minus G zero. Therefore, in step zero of the inductive construction that we are about to do, so step zero means constructing H zero, <clears throat> we only have to solve the following lifting or extension problem. We have the map from P zero to <clears throat> given by the difference between F zero and G zero. So this goes to Q0 and here I have Q1. And I want to solve this problem here or this extension problem and the solution shall be declared H0. And then if we have that, then definitely the first uh, equality is satisfied. Again, we want to use that P0 as projective, but this map from Q1 to uh, Q0 is not subjective. It's only subjective onto the kernel of eta. But since we take the difference between F0 and G0, and they both induce the same map on H0, this actually lands in the kernel of eta. And onto the kernel we have a subjection. So we can solve this. Maybe it's the left, <laughs> I think it's left, right, the not up, up so down. So how, right. how many squares does this world have? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we are. Good. So if somebody from Microsoft watches this video on YouTube, <laughs> please repair the whiteboard app. It's so buggy. Step. That could get you into legal trouble, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> Step one. Yeah, maybe I will be banned from <laughs> all the platforms now. Step one. Um, so we have to solve, let me write it down, and bring uh, H0 on the other side in the equality above. Right, we have to find H1 with that property. H0 is already constructed, so there is a known map on the right-hand side. We want to find H1. So again, some lifting problem we have to solve now. So, <clears throat> in other words, H1 is the solution of the following lifting problem. Okay, so here is, first of all, there is Q1 here. But again, to apply the projectivity, we need an epimorphism here. So I'm claiming this is not landing in Q1, this is actually landing in the kernel of um, Q1. And by our assumption, this is the same as the image of Q2. So if we show that this map lies in the kernel, then this is 
the image and therefore we have an epimorphism here and we can really apply the projectivity of pi 1. So step 1 is done as soon as we show that this map lands in the kernel of Q1. And this is a computation. So we apply Q1 to F1 minus G1 minus H0 composed P1. And let's see what comes out. So we use the fact that F star G star are chain maps. Therefore, we can uh, write Q1 F1 as F0 composed P1, then minus G0 composed P1, and then I just keep what I have. And I'm here. Now I use what I know about H0. And I know that um, Q, sorry, is it Q1? Yes. I know that Q1 composed H0, sorry for that mistake, is the same as F0 minus G0. Okay, so this is <coughs> how we uh, constructed H0, composed P1. And now you see, resolving the bracket, that everything cancels off and we get a zero. So it really lands here in the kernel of Q1. This is step one and now just proceed inductively. Next steps are just the same with n instead of one. And that concludes the proof, the fundamental theorem of logical algebra.